Kostelin qui a inscrit avec une dizaine de
Uh, yes, I, the, this paper by a total chance is the narrative sequel, like a sort of remake of Ricardo's lovely paper this morning, although I'm afraid it won't be as beautifully organized and argued as his. Um, and I have to begin, in fact, with a somewhat shamefaced confession. Uh, this idea has been kicking around in my um, head for quite a long time, uh, but I've never had the courage to pursue it. Uh, in great part because I'm not at all sure I believe it. And I still don't be sure I believe it. Um, but, and it also takes me out of my usual comfort zone, which is Indo-Iranian and Greek, uh, partly into Germanic, which is pretty alien for me. Um, but then what better place to breach the history of the Danes than in Denmark? And so I beg your indulgence in that <laughs> regard. Um, some years ago, I heard a lecture by John Lindau, who is the um, Scandinavian, specialist in Scandinavian mythology at UC Berkeley, uh, in which he discussed the, the story of the birth of the Avenger of Baldur, Odin's son, as told in some detail in Saxo Grammaticus's Gesta Danorum, uh, though they uh, come under different names there. The story involves the disguise and cross-dressing of a god, sexual misconduct, loss of kingship and exile. And it immediately brought to mind, to my mind, another story about cross-dressing and loss of kingship and exile uh, uh, in my own bailiwick, uh, namely ancient India. The story is found in the great Sanskrit epic, the Mahabharata, in the fourth book, the so-called Virata Parvan, when the Pandavas, the five hero brothers of that epic, uh, finish their 12-year exile with a year of living in disguise in the open, which involves the cross-dressing of the most skillful warrior among them, the middle bro brother Arjuna. Um, the episodes have very different purposes in their respective texts and traditions, and they are also mirror images of each other. The relevant e uh, episodes are found in opposite order. They are also both comparatively late, Saxo Grammaticus is generally placed in the late 12th or early 13th century CE, which is really alien territory to me. Um, while uh, book four of the Ma Mahabharata is generally considered, though not on the best of grounds, uh, to be a latish addition to the epic, uh, which of course itself is not uh, in among the earliest um, uh, Indian texts having taken shape somewhere in the centuries around the year zero. For all these reasons and for others that will emerge, I am cherry of, of claiming a common Indo-European origin for these stories or even a common thematic complex. But I think it's worth exploring what at least two Indo-European traditions did with the notion of cross-dressing, which is not the usual heroic epic bag, a part of the bag of tricks of uh, the epics that we know. Um, in what follows for convenience, I will talk as if these stories are variants of each other, but as I just said, I am far from committed to that view. The Germanic version, even in the fairly discursive treatment by Saxo Grammaticus, uh, the other Germanic traditions, uh, traditions seem to have nothing relevant to my part of the story, is relatively compressed, and since it's in Latin, it's far removed from whatever might have been its original verbal dress and I will therefore summarize the story before turning to the Mahabharata. We take up the story after the killing of Baldur, son of the great god Odin, uh, uh, whom I will call by those names, although they don't come up with those names in uh, Saxon. Um, uh, Odin seeks the counsel of prophets and diviners on how to avenge his son, and it is foretold to him that the avenger will be born, will be a son of his, born to Rinda, the daughter of a certain earthly king. In order to accomplish this prophecy, he goes to the king in disguise or in a series of disguises. First as a soldier, who being spectacularly successful in battle, ingratiates himself with the king, who then favors his amorous designs on his daughter. But she does not and slaps him uh, when he makes his approach. The next year he uh, returns as a smith, or an artisan, in particular a jewelry maker who produces ornaments for the ladies of the court, uh, but his offering of especially exquisite jewelry and of himself to Rinda again meets with refusal, 
uh, despite her father's pleading her case. He re returns again briefly as a soldier to no better avail. And finally, he dresses as a woman, presents himself at court again, this time as a physician, but also as a servant maid to the princess who performs intimate services for her. The next time, the next part of the story is very shocking, certainly to our modern Me Too sensibilities. Rinda gets sick. It's not clear why or whether Odin had anything to do with it. He or she, that is the servant maid, claims to have a cure, but one that's so nasty that the patient must be tied to the bed before it is administered. Her father himself ties her to the bed, uh, leaves her there with the physician um, who immediately rapes her. Uh, and in due course, she bears the infant Avenger and herself, of course, dis disappears from the story. The gods are outraged by Odin's behavior and his potential effect on public worship. And so they strip him of his divine headship and its trappings exile him and put him another in his place. It was Linda's view that his cross-dressing was a major factor in the God's decision as being especially shameful. They bring his exile to a close after approximately 10 years, rather like the Pandava's uh, time-limited exile, and reinstate him, ousting the uh, placeholder who meets a very sticky end in Sweden. Uh, and the avenging of Baldur's death is set in motion. The grim center of this story is quite distinct from the generally lighthearted tone of the Mahabharata episode with which I want to compare it. Moreover, the constricted focus on only three characters in the Rinda story, Odin, the king, and his daughter, Rinda, contrasts strongly with the extensive cast of characters in the Mahabharata version. Again, a brief pricey is in order Basically, my 20 minutes go to plot summary, but uh, there doesn't seem any way to avoid this. Uh, <clears throat> the Virata Parvan is part of the sprawling treatment in the first books of the Mahabharata of the events leading up to the vast ruinous war that forms the subject of the epic. Our heroes are the five Pandava brothers who vie with their cousins, the Kauravas, for the control of the kingdom, a conflict that ultimately leads to the war. After the debacle of a dicing match held in conjunction with the royal consecration of the oldest Pandava, Yudhishthira, Yudhishthira is deprived of his kingship and all five brothers, along with their shared wife, Draupadi, are sent into exile for 12 years, a forest sojourn that occupies the vast third book of the epic. But before they can return to real life, as it were, a 13th year is mandated to be spent in the open but in disguise. If their identities are discovered in that year, the whole cycle of exile must begin again. The Virata Parvan opens with the five brothers at the end of the 12 year exile period, debating where to go and what disguises to assume during the 13th year. The brothers, for those of you unfamiliar with the Mah Mahabharata, are Yudhishthira, the oldest and their leader, as well as King, though as just noted, recently deposed. Uh, Bhima or Bhimasena, the wild man of the brothers, a fierce, superhumanly powerful warrior to whom we will return. Arjuna, the most skillful warrior, especially with the bow. These three are the sons of one mother, Kunti. The remaining two rather uh, unimportant brothers are the sons of another mother uh, and are twins. Um, the group decides to approach a king named Virata in a rich and powerful country a bit on the margins to spend their year in disguise. They do not present themselves to him as nobles or warriors, but as ordinary people with skills to put in the king's service. Yudhishthira proposes to pass as a dicing master, a clear irony given that his loss at the dice is what set the whole exile in motion. Bhima will be a cook. He has very large appetite uh, in, in sort of the rest of the epic. Uh, the twins choose to be a horse groom and a cattle tender, respectively, and Draupadi will offer herself as a lady's maid. Arjuna, the middle brother, the great bowman, will dress in women's clothes and teach dancing and singing to the girls and women of the court. Their plan goes without a hitch. They are enthusiastically welcomed. They become pets of the king 
and they have great success in their chosen world, roles. In particular, once the king has ascertained that the dancing ma master is sexually harmless, he sets him to teaching his artistic accomplishment to the girls in the court, especially his own daughter, essentially unsupervised. In this generally happy and tranquil period, there is, however, one nasty episode. Draupadi draws the eye of a man named Kichika, the king's marshal and brother-in-law, and he mounts a campaign to seduce her. We will return to this episode. Meanwhile, the Kauravas, the Pandavas' enemies, remember, stage a cattle raid on Virata's considerable herds, which leads to a lengthy pitched battle in which Virata is captured. His feckless son, who pretends to be a great warrior, has to take to the field of battle. He lacks a charioteer. The transvestite dancing master, Arjuna, remember, uh, is suggested, and he is finally pressed into service, still in women's clothes and making a great deal out of how he doesn't know how to put on soldiers' garments. Uh, <clears throat> the battle is intense and prolonged. Arjuna takes over and is entirely and single-handedly victorious, routing great forces, the great forces of the Kauravas. Afterwards, the Pandavas return to the court of Virata and disclose their real identities to the king. His kingdom, his cattle, and his life having been saved by the Pandavas, Virata offers his daughter, whom the disguised Arjuna had been teaching to dance, to Arjuna in marriage. He declines for himself on the delicate grounds that it won't look right because he's been living in close proximity to her for a year, but accepts on the part of, on behalf of his son Abhimanyu, and the wedding then takes place. Even this brief account shows how expansive and busy the Mahabharata story is, with a cast of literally thousands and numerous episodes. The Van Buyten in English translation occupies more than a hundred pages against the paltry few of the Rinda story. In what follows, I will argue that the events and actions found in the concentrated narrative that lies behind the Rinda story have been parceled out across the larger campus, canvas and more numerous personnel of the Mahabharata, but that the kinship or at least parallelism of the stories can still be discerned. So let's start with the structural points of contact. This is all sort of vaguely on your handout, um, but I'm not going to give you numbers. I, uh, it's a short handout. You can find them. Um, the center of each story is the unexpected advent at a particular king's court of a stranger or strangers in disguise, indeed in the disguise of a woman. The king enthusiastically receives the disguise and not only incorporates him or them into his inner circle, but willingly puts him or them into close contact with his own daughter. But this center occupies different functions in each of the stories because as I have already noted, the stories are mirror images of each other. In the Mahabharata versions, the Pandavas uh, come to the court from exile, an exile that also involved the oldest of them, having been deposed from his kingship. After their time at court and the dramatic events that transpire there, they leave exile and return to their old life, taking steps to regain their lost kingship. By contrast, Odin comes to the court from his old life, and after his time at court, and the dramatic events that transpire there, he is stripped of his kingship and sent into lengthy exile. His loss of kingship and exile are the results of his action at court, while the pond of his exile precipitates their stay in court, but is unrelated to the reasons for their exile. Nevertheless, the elements are all there in both stories. Loss of kingship, exile, disguise and cross-dressing in a royal court, intimate contact with a royal maiden. And further, perhaps most important, the cross-dressing episodes in each story are associated with particularly egregious acts of violence on the part of the cross-dresser, as we will see. But in order to have any hope of convincing you that the stories are related, I must su supplement this presentation of broad structural parallels with an account of more granular similarities and also give some exp explanation for why the core of the stories the male disguised as a female and his unprecedented access to a tender young royal girl plays out so differently. A brutal rape engineered by trickery in the Rinda story 
sexual self-restraint arising from a delicacy of moral feeling, of which there isn't a lot in the Mahabharata usually, uh, in, the, in the epic. Uh, let us begin with the beginnings of each story, the disguised approach to the king. In the Rinda story, Odin comes four times in temporally spaced sequence. First as a soldier, second as a smith, again briefly as a soldier, and finally as a maidservant with medical skill. There is, of course, no series of approaches by the Pandavas. They simply show up at the same time in a body. But I would suggest that the diachronic set of disguises assumed by Odin are simply synchronically distributed among the numerous Pandavas. In other words, a prototype story of this sort would require a series of failed attempts ending in a successful one, as in the Rinda story. The Pandavas can absorb this multiplicity. Most of the disguises themselves do not match up particularly well across the story. But of course, the crucial decide, disguise, the transvestite one, is where our focus is. Even here, I would suggest that there is a split and redistribution. Odin presents himself as both a lady's maid and a physician, with the former role allowing him close contact with Rinda. In the Mahabharata, the cross-dressing Arjuna is granted intimate access to the young ladies of the court. And though he do certainly doesn't present himself as a physician, he does command arcane and specialized knowledge. And it is this knowledge that, that puts him in close contact with the girls. He is, however, of course, not a chambermaid. But Draupadi is. And I would uh, claim that this part of the role has been split off and reassigned to uh, Draupadi, the Pandava's wife, joint wife. Uh, she assumes the role of lady's maid while Arjuna uses his higher level, level training to ingratiate himself with the women at the court. Draupadi has an even more important structural role in the story viewed from the point of view of the Rinda narrative. Previously, I asked why the core of the two stories, the contact between the disguised transvestite and the princess, plays out so differently in the two stories. The horrifying rape on the Germanic side, the principled refusal of sexual contact on the Indic one. But here I would claim that the rape episode is not absent from the Virata story. It has instead again been displaced onto a different couple with a different gender twist. The couple is Draupadi and Kichika. Recall that Kichika, the king's brother-in-law, is overcome with lust for Draupadi, the maid of his sister, the queen. He propositions her, and she in indignantly refuses him, just as Rinda did. Just as the dis uh, 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 so, just as the disguised Odin, having ingratiated himself with the king, enlists the king's services in winning Rinda. So does Kichika approach his sister, the queen, to help him get Draupadi. The queen suggests that he have some surah, an alcoholic drink, and luxurious food prepared, and she, the queen, will feign a sudden hankering for drink and send her maid to Kichika to fetch it. And it's perhaps not too far-fetched, or maybe it is, uh, to suggest that the alcoholic surah that serves as a pretext to put Draupadi in Kichika's power serves the same function as the medicated potion that uh, Odin and Sis will cure Rinda. And certainly the queen's enthusiastic participation in the plot rivals that of Rinda's father, the king. In any case, protesting mightily against being sent to Kichika's, Draupadi goes there in the end when ordered by her mistress, the queen. He then has her alone in his quarters and he starts to caress her. She knocks him to the ground and runs to the assembly hall where the king and Yudhishthira are, among others, Kichika pursues her, grabs her by the hair, knocks her to the ground, and kicks her. I would like to emphasize that this is one of the most violent scenes against women in the whole of the Mahabharata, arguably even more violent than the, than the scene uh, of Draupadi being dragged into the Sabha, into the assembly hall after the dicing match. But the Kichika Draupadi story has yet another twist. And this twist involves another gender switch. Soon after the attempted rape, Draupadi complains about it to Bhima. Uh, remember, one of her husbands and the most headstrong and powerfully, physically powerful. After working herself into a truly impressive swivet, 
She demands that he kill Hichika. Bhima agrees and has her arrange a, a tryst with Kichika at night in Arjuna's dancing pavilion, which is deserted at that time. Bhima goes to the pavilion before Kichika and arrays himself on a bed. It is impenetrably dark in the pavilion, and when the eager Kichika arrives, he begins to stroke the lurking Bhima, who, of course, he thinks is Draupadi. Uh, Bhima attacks him. A violent fight ensues, resulting in Kichika's death. In his rage, Bhima pounds all of Kichika's extremities into his trunk, rem uh, rendering him like a ball of flesh, quote unquote. So in terms of the Rinda story, we have both a displacement and a reversal. The rape of Rinda was per perpetrated by Odin disguised as a woman. In the Virata Parvan, this rape or attempted rape is displaced to what is at the beginning of the episode, a more conventional pairing, a beautiful and helpless woman like Rinda and a lustful man who makes no attempt to disguise his masculinity. But that pairing is quickly turned on its head. The beautiful helpless woman is replaced by an uncontrollably powerful warrior who was passing himself off as a woman. The two violent scenes in these two stories are again mirror images. Odin, as a fake woman, victimizes a real woman. Kichika, a real man, attempts to victimize what turns out to be a fake woman. The results of the encounter are also mirror images in one way, parallel, parallel in another. In both cases, the character who does the gender switch is the victor. Disguised as a woman, Odin rapes the girl. Disguised as a woman, Bhima kills Kichika. But in the first case, the gender switcher is the initial aggressor, while in the other, he is the targeted victim. Unfortunately, due to lack of time, I cannot continue with a point-by-point -point comparison of the two stories. I will simply end by pointing again to the suggestive but far from proven of, uh, appearance of kinship uh, between them. And I will further, further argue, and this may be the most important point here, uh, which is made on the second page, so you can turn on the handle, uh, should you desire. <clears throat> that um, uh, although they most likely cannot be reconstructed to a narrative archetype in Proto-Indo-European, they do show very similar responses to the warrior, war, warrior culture we do reconstruct for Proto-Indo-European. The polarization of woman and warrior is in both stories played out by the transformation of warrior into woman, the two furthest extremes in such a culture. This transformation in turn, and this is I think the, the important point, requires an act of hyper-masculine violence on the part of the warrior turned woman as if to redeem his temporary se sexual switch. Uh, this transformation, uh, uh, um, the rape of Rinda by the disguised Odin, the stunning single-handed defeat of the Kauravas by Arjuna in woman's dress, and the hyper-violent killing of Kichika by Bhima impersonating a woman. Thank you. Yes. Um, presumably, you have thought about Achilles and Sophia Yeah, yeah, I got it. I mean, they're, they're I mean, there, there must be tons of things, but as you're going through the ones, I, I, I could construct a story. Every one of your points, I could. Yeah, you know, you know, Achilles was one of the first I thought of, but there are tons. You know, they're already in Indi in Indic. You have the Shikandan story, which is really interesting, uh, uh, where uh, 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 a girl uh, it, who was. Uh, deprived of her husband by uh, Bhishma, uh, is reborn as a man, sort of, as who will kill uh, Bhishma. So it's a, it's a, it's a sort of Balder <laughs> uh, Avenger story. <coughs> there are a bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, why I wanted to restrict it here to only these two, <coughs> sorry, is, first of all, if I had had to do three plot summaries, uh, we, we would be here until nighttime, but also because the thing that first struck me was the connection of cross-dressing and exile, 
and there are probably ways to configure We're all of those things in exile. But you know, this is you know, this is kind of like straightforward. You're in exile, exile. And so um, I thought, you know, but yeah, I sort of keep in mind that Achilles was both pre-exiled and post-exile. Right? To say he was sent off into yeah, 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 the yeah, mountains, yeah, yeah. and then as stage right. one, so that's exile, and then goes to Skiros on exile, yeah. and then is sent, you know, more or less unwillingly to Troy, exile number three. So yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I you know. Uh, I'm not, I'm just, no, I, I, no, I, I, no, it has come to seem to me that it would be interesting just to, to collect all the stories of the cross-dressing stories and see what, which ones kind of match up enough not to be, you know, just random episodes. Yeah. Actually, um, it's also just a, uh, it's also a Sorry, I, I, I can't hear, hear very well. <laughs> when I thought it was about the cross-dressing at first, uh, and so about Germanic, I actually thought you were, were talking about an episode from the Persic Edda, where Thor crossed Right, 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 right. No, that, yeah, I don't. Yeah. I, I didn't know the story about Rinda. I, but I get the story about Thor has a bit of a combination of yeah, 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 essentially, yeah, yeah. without the sexual motive. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I have, you know, I think once, once, I start, you know, exploring these things. Uh, you will never, you know, hear the end of it. Probably. <laughs> yeah, uh, I had a very short uh, comment. Uh, thank you for this paper. I love it. Uh, um, so the three categories in Saxo Grammaticus, uh, like the the three. Uh, uh, masks of, of uh, um, could fit in the three uh, classes of Dumasilian. Well, yeah, okay. I I went through the. Yeah, I, if I, I were Dumasilian, how would I make this into Dumasil? Yeah. And I have to say, at some point, I thought Dumasil couldn't make this into Dumasil. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, because the problem is the is the doubling of the warrior, mm -hmm. and there's no way to make that into anything but warrior. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And I have wondered about the doubling of the warrior until I decided that, it, you know, mm -hmm. the, the point, because of the association of violence and cross-dressing, mm -hmm. that it was, right. but yeah, no, I mean, the, the, yeah. the, it, 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 it sort of cries out yeah. for a Dumasilian yeah. interpretation yeah. until you yeah. actually look at the stuff and then you say, wait, where's the producer here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. uh, or, yes. you know, yeah, so. May I just add two more points there? Well, I think it's time to, not to make speakers soon, but I was just thinking of this um, curious thing that, that, that Odin, as he is described in, you know, in, in other texts, it's, uh, it's not necessarily cross-dressing, but he's accused of effeminate yeah, behavior, yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. associated with mm -hmm. savor, with divination. So yeah, Loki yeah, accuses yeah, 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 Odin yeah, yeah. of Doing safer things that yeah yeah right, right exactly yeah, yeah. And, and this this is this is a, a one of so it's not a masculine figure yeah yeah, yeah 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 so that's uh, so it's not really uh, that's interesting uh, there's also a slightly interesting thing in that Tichika on his way to this tryst dolls himself up in such a way that it begins to seem as though he's cross dressing almost uh -huh. even though he's going off to try to rape or you know have sex with Draupadi. You know, there's much made of what he does with his hair and the earrings and everything. <laughs> so, you know, there's it, it sort of, you know, creeps into what was going to be a heterosexual, you know, a super heterosexual thing. So I think, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a motif that kind of makes yeah. its way into a large yeah. chunk of the story. Yeah. Yeah. I think actually yeah. now we have to turn. Sorry, but we, we need to go on. Yes. <laughs> Enter the scene. Talk about the Indian European trading language myth. Uh, so, yes, I'm, I'm Espen Tiro. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, how to play in language myth, politics, and 
and that one keep it uh, just just because of the cloud option. Yeah. Can everybody hear me? No? <laughs> just oh, almost. <laughs> Uh, just to give an outline about what I mean about the plagues, and in fact, you know, there, there's a genetic data uh, proving that there is a really old uh, plague bacteria that's been found. And uh, uh, this is basically connected to, to the, the, the Yamnaya uh, migrations, which has been like seen as proof of the step uh, hypothesis, um, saying that the Indo-European languages was brought into Europe. Uh, from uh, the step, uh, so so they found these uh, Yersinia pestis bacteria in uh, in Kirken cemeteries, um, and uh, they've shown that that they were present since the beginning of the Yamnaya uh, migrations, but also in Europe before. So this kind of disproves the, the idea that uh, there was brought along with the migrations. Uh, so in the beginning, they thought that the bubonic plague was, <laughs> in the beginning, the bubonic plague was partly excluded uh, before the beginning of the first millennia BC. But, uh, but uh, new evidence has now like shown that uh, it's this data has been pushed back until the, the, the second millennia BC. Uh, from Kirken Cemetery, so also in, in step-related uh, genetic. Uh, so my question is, if uh, these uh, people who brought along the language into Europe and knew about this, uh, this disease, then did the disease leave any uh, trace uh, in their language, uh, poetry, religion, and uh, material culture? And, uh, and I'm curious to see if, if such data might uh, might prove any uh, might give any signs about how the disease was working at the time. Uh, so, but as David Anthony, uh, it's it's, uh, it's clear, but David Anthony say very very clearly uh, that there's no real uh, rules that exist in combining these um, these data. So 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 we have to be uh, aware of the methodology. So. One, some of the problems that I've seen is that we have to, to have an understanding of concepts of epidemics and ancient cultures. Uh, and we need to uh, be aware that, that we only have indicative uh, data and the very, very few, uh, there's a lack of, of clear descriptions of, of the disease and, the, the, and how they work. Uh, and then we also need to be careful when applying modern knowledge upon ancient ideas and, of course, also ancient bacteria, because uh, you know it's not the same bacteria, so we don't really know how they, they work. Uh, anyway, uh, what I what I will try to do is uh, look at the two parallel systems that have been mentioned by in the uh, Encyclopedia of European Culture of Mallory and Adams one who's comparing uh, Apollos Mintos to Kotra, and another that compares uh, the Indo-Iranian Ariaman, uh, Ariaman with, uh, and his connection with the Kuo Mesa, and uh, the Irish hero Erimon. So Rodra, he's uh, the archer who's shooting diseases, and he's a healer. He's connected with rodents, uh, Aku, the mole, uh, and you have this epithet that, uh, that has been interpreted uh, as connected to the rodents, the taunting one, Banku. He has a parental relationship to Ganesha, uh, and he's associated with fevers and coughs. Uh, but Ganesha, he's the, the god of poetry, and he's connected with rats. And uh, Apollos Mintos, he's the archer shooting diseases as well. He's a healer. He's connected with the uh, rodents. Uh, from his epithet, uh, from Smintos, meaning the red. He as well have this epithet, uh, 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 meaning the one with the oblique gains, also connected to the red. Uh, he has a parental uh, relationship to Ascolipus, who is connected with the mole, and uh, he's a guy of poetry. 
um, well, as Gleifers, he's the, the medical guy, and his name is derived from uh, Scalops, uh, the blind rat or mole. The etymology is supported by the interpretation of, of this Asclepius sanctuary as being built to resemble a mole's hill. And then he's also connected to a fevers. Uh, then we have these terracotta figures that's been connected to uh, an As Asclepius and the uh, Apollos Mentor's court. And I will return to uh, this later. So we see a, a a rather profound relationship between these two gods, uh, which has been explained uh, uh, in detail in this uh, article or this um, uh, yeah, article by Gregory. Gregory. Another interesting fact about, about these two gods, uh, Smintos and uh, Ultra, is that uh, they first shoot cattle and then men and, uh, you know, I've looked at this as a as a uh, indicator of, of what how the plague might have been working. Uh, so we see that that the Apollo is shooting first the mole, then the, the dog, and then the men. And Ultra he's uh, asked to keep his ox and men uh, killing weapons uh, far away. Oh, uh, the. <coughs> The correlation, uh, collocation, beast and man's name uh, in this particular order is seems to be an Indo-European theme, and um, it's been by Carol Watkins uh, associated with the basic formula. So the other concept of, of a plague is from seen in the Barashnum uh, purifica purification ritual from the Iranian text. Uh, it's a, a ritual that's supposed to clean a person that's been in contact with uh, the corpses. Uh, the person should be purified. He's, he's called the Rimani, and uh, he's uh, supposed to be purified or cleaned with uh, cow urine, uh, dust, and water. Uh, after the ritual is performed three times, he's, uh, he has to be secluded from the rest of the society for, for nine days. In which he have to clean himself and his clothes with uh, cow's urine again. This ritual has been compared with uh, other episodes um, from the Celtic uh, text, in which uh, milk from seven white cows are supposed to be or are able to cure soldiers on the battlefield from poisonous enemy weapons. Uh, this episode. In the Irish text, is uh, connected to Edimon, the Irish hero, who, etimolal, etimolal, uh, whose name is connected with uh, Arya. <laughs> uh, and Arya Man is uh, the master of the Barashman, so it seems to be a connection here. Uh, so uh, I'll try to, to make uh, to see if, if these two systems can be in fact uh, connected and. Uh, Linguistically, it seems that, uh, uh, that there can be a connection, uh, at least um, Milicia, he wrote an article <coughs> to compare the Middle Persian then with the Greek, then meaning a third and fifth, with Greek uh, noimos, meaning play, uh, and he takes us back to the Indo-European stem, a noimo, polluting or polluted substance. We see that uh, rem is uh, in fact uh, speaking uh, is used to signify the polluted matter from the production ritual uh, and the Romani is uh, is derived from them which come from them uh, the money who's supposed to be purified in the production ritual uh, in another article in fact from the militia as well he <laughs> explains the hapax big uh, uh, from Vint that uh, 19, as referring to the Gomez of the uh, Barashan ritual. Uh, so he proposes that uh, this hapax is uh, a reflection of Indo-European pitro uh, from the Indo-European root uh, bake. And uh, he mentions that 
uh, Eric Camp, he connected the, the same route to the epithet of Apollo by processing, uh, by using an uh, ancient view path to CPU. So these articles, they, they give the impression that there might be a shared terminology between the two uh, systems, uh, since Apollo is is uh, connected not only with uh, the sickness, but also with the word Leumus, as he had the epithet uh, uh, And the same root is used to distinguish the polluted substance from corpses in the Iranian uh, rituals. And uh, the purifying <coughs> substance is, is uh, used, uh, is, is distinguished by the, the same root uh, as in another epithet uh, Apollo Poipos. Uh, but uh, there are other resemblances as well. Uh, for example, there is a concept of nine days. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a nine day seclusion after this purification ritual in the uh, Vindidat, the Iranian tradition. And uh, in the Iliad, the first book of the Iliad, uh, we observe that the missiles of Apollo is ranging. In the, in the Greek camps for nine days, and on the 10th, um, Achilles is calling for the people to assemble. <coughs> and also there is a purification ritual, it seems, in the, in the first book of the Iliad, the, the, uh, concerning the plague, when Agamemnon is ordering the, the people to uh, wash their pollution, pollution or uh, purify themselves and, and cast their defilement into the sea uh, to get rid of the plague. Uh, so what does this uh, text tell us? Well, they tell us that we might have a Greek and indo iranian comparative material uh, who show a, a common terminology of uh, disease, uh, an epidemic that's connected with, uh, with rodents, mice, rats, and moles. An epidemic that's connected with contact with corpses, um, a purification of one's body, but also of clothes. Uh, an epidemic that may affect cattle and men. A concept of nine days and the, uh, the idea that maybe uh, you could be healed, or the hope at least. Uh, the genetic data it tells that the, the plague at least have been present in the, since the beginning of the Yamaya migrations and that. Uh, uh, but that uh, it was not transmitted with fleas, at least uh, before uh, 2000 BC, excluding uh, rats, uh, basically. So what do we know about the, the plague today is that uh, people normally acquire the plague from uh, flea bites, but, they, but it can also be spread through contact with infected tissue. And we have a decoupulation period of uh, two to 10 days, and uh, a mortality of untreated bubonic plague of 60%. Uh, so it seems that, that uh, 2000 BC may fit all right with uh, Greek and uh, Indo Iranian shared terminology. And that uh, this infection of clothes could be a, a, an effective uh, method of preventing flea bites by uh, killing uh, lice or fleas. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, personal hygiene by disinfecting your hands or your full body could also be a very efficient way to prevent uh, infection of diseases. Uh, and this incubation, uh, incubation period of uh, two to uh, 10 days makes this uh, nine days uh, concept uh, seem like it could have been interpreted into the ritual. Uh, and, and I don't know about the, the mortality of 60% if it really leaves a hope to get healed, but uh, it could, could uh, leave a hope. Uh, so uh, uh, it seems that the plank uh, could be uh, 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 could be possible. It could be possible that, in fact, we're speaking about the plague in these rituals, except for the fact of uh, the, the cattle and men, because uh, Livestock are normally not known to be affected by the, the Yersinia species bacteria. So either we exclude this, uh, the plague as a possible candidate, or we, uh, we say that the other diseases 
if we're speaking about diseases, uh, could have been uh, 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 incorporated into uh, uh, the concept of, of epidemics. Now, um, I have this idea that the Irish material could support the idea that, in fact, it's the plague that we're speaking about in the Greek and Indo Iranian uh, material. Uh, since we see uh, systematic resemblances between the, the purification ritual, but uh, that we're not, we don't hear about rodents in the, in the Irish material. And uh, then I, I heard about this um, legend of uh, Tax Morrow and uh, Ali, Ali Man and Jim Stead from the Levayat, which is a relatively late text, but uh, might be conservative. Uh, because it's a legend of uh, the building of the first Tower of Silence and the discovery of cow's urine of Gomis as the purifying substance. Uh, but it's also been identified as uh, the legend of uh, the one-armed god by DC. So uh, we may see the, the deeds of this uh, hero who's also been identified as, as the, the one the one eyed god, uh, Horatius Socrates, who's Praying to the to the father Tiberius, Tiberius um, and after jumps in the water and are, are saved from the enemy missiles, he, he's able to swim across uh, the wounds. So we again see a, a purifying a holy liquid protecting a hero from enemy uh, missiles. And uh, I, I suppose, I, I suggest that uh, maybe these terracotta figures is connected with uh, uh, Apollo uh, might be interpreted as uh, as a as a connect, connection with the one-eyed or one-handed god. But I, I, I saw this, but, but I didn't see. It. Don't, don't have any, <laughs> any answer at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well. <laughs> The genetic data is telling us that the, the plague is not connected to rodents before 2000 BC. So, uh, what might have happened is, is my suggestion, that a certain uh, purification or protectionary ritual existed at an early stage of the European culture, and that this was, at least to some extent, associated with a complex surrounding a one eyed and one armed god. And after a breakup of unity, uh, the future Greeks and Indo Iranians came in contact with a disease that they connected uh, with rodents. And uh, this disease was, uh, in the end, interpreted into uh, uh, an already existing system of uh, rituals. Uh, so uh, it's also already been suggested that uh, the Sminto's cult is Semitic, and uh, uh, it seems uh, it seems that the, at least the word Smintas is Semitic. Uh, so we can't really rule out Semitic influence, but uh, it seems that also that Indo -European, an Indo-European origin of a myth seems to be possible. So I almost used 20 minutes and uh, I'm finished. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know that, that for Apollo, it's also been uh, suggested that this is a reference to his um, uh, to his connection with the oracle. You know, so he don't really give straight uh, uh, straight answers. So he's walking crookedly. You know, but uh, no, I, I can't say any more than than uh, people who know more about this stuff than me has connected to this as a as a 
as a sign of, of uh, indication of contact or uh, association with uh, rodents or rats. Sorry. Yeah. You associate with Rudra. Uh, that just means I think that's more affinity with what we would perhaps call the same malaria. And then it says with bubonic plague. But so I'm not sure I would make the too close a connection between Tuckman and the disease if we're trying to identify it. No, okay. Wait, I'm, 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 I'm. I, I couldn't hear. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned the word Tuckman. Yeah. Uh, in its association with Rudra primarily in the Harvard data. Oh, yeah. Okay. And that disease has more affinity with malaria. Okay, okay. Yeah. Than it does with bubonic plague. Mm. So I'm not sure to what degree I would include that. No, okay. No, that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So this is just one single remark about the last point on smooth folks. Yeah. But you have mentioned this as a Semitic, Semitic word? Uh, well, it's, it's been uh, proposed that, that it could be uh, a, a borrowing from, from Akkadian, in fact. Shush. We speak about the, the number of nine uh, as well uh, during the conference, and and I said in the beginning that, that I mean it's a little bit difficult to apply modern knowledge on on these ancient ideas. But yeah. I just thought it was very uh, it, it was pretty, you know, that, that there is this yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. this period, you know. So I don't know if we can use it if it's a good argument. But, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
Just push that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of a, a little bit of a advertisement for those of you who may be staying on an extra day. I would recommend that you try to get up to Nevo. There's a uh, there's a uh, 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 still, what what a, a, a exhibition art exhibition up at Nevo um, by L. A. Ring and H. A. Brandekilde, and these are two Danish uh, uh, painters from around the turn of the century who did social realism. And it's an excellent exhibition. It, you just you can catch the train at the main station, and it's about what 45 minute train ride up to Nevo, to the Nevo Gord, uh, Mallory Samling. It would be a good outing if you could make it tomorrow, because this is a mainly linguists here, and you all know who Rasmus Rask is, the genius. Uh, Danish linguist, and if you go there, you're treated to a picture of the house where Rasmus Rask grew up, and images of where he grew up, and it's a really interesting exhibition to think, how did this boy genius, this linguistic genius, how did he fit into this old style, this uh, kind of farming community. Uh, it gives you a sense of where where he came from. So I would uh, highly recommend that you go and see this exhibition if you can. So that's my little pitch here. I'll save the next slide for later. Can I do that? I don't know. How do you turn it off? Yeah, of course. How do I get rid of this? If you want, to, if you press B, B, yeah. If you want to just letter B, the letter B. Mm -hmm. Where the hell is it? Mm -hmm. Oh no, oh here it is. Yeah. Okay. Like yeah. I'll turn right. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Now uh, we get into the paper, and I've got a handout for you there. Building on my recent study of female character types in Bharata's Natya Shastra, an early Sanskrit treatise on Indian theater and dramaturgy from around the beginning of the Common Era, this paper looks at Bharata in the context of ancient Greek literature. As noticed in the earlier study, Bharata drew principally on examples of the physiognomic use of animal similes in the Gargiya Jyotisha, a Sanskrit compilation of astral science from about the same time. Using the same protasis apodosis syntactical structure, he adapted the physiognomic similes to portray harem women on stage. In this paper, I take it a step further and examine a similar omen structure and use of animal similes found in Simonides' Greek iambic satire of women. In ancient Greek, the 7th century BC poem of Simonides styled simply Simonides 7, referring to the seventh fragment of his poems in iambic meter, offers a unique description of female character types based on comparisons with both different animals and natural elements of the earth and sea. Hence, it is often styled seminatis on women. So also in the Indian Sanskrit tradition, the Natra Shastra offers a list of female character types based on their likenesses to various kinds of animals. In addition to utilizing the same stylistic device of metaphor, the Sanskrit list 
contains five of the ten similes mentioned in the Greek poem of Simonides. The text of Simonides, as we have it, is incomplete. It is composed in verses of iambic <laughs> meter and generally labeled as a satire on women. Simonides' intent is to illustrate the different kinds of women a man might encounter and ultimately avoid or choose in a typical man-woman relationship, such as might be found in marriages. As the classicist Robin Osborne points out, the poem was likely a favorite at the symposium, where alcohol consumption was excessive and the, co co and the conversation often denigrated into hubris. Each type of woman is given the name of a known animal and then described according to recognized, often less than human character and behavior. This is precisely the divinatory protasis apotasis structure of omens, but syntactically in reverse, where the apotasis is given first, followed by the protasis of characteristics. The satirical way with which Simonides presents the omens conceals their underlying divinatory structure. What he did is offer omens in the guise of an iambic hubris. Comparing Simonides' list with the animal similes found in Bharata's Natyat Shastra, we find that there are five direct matches. If we look at the chart here, we find the matches are the monkey, the donkey, the sow, the mare, and the bitch. The remaining three animals, types of animals, down at the bottom, the fox, the ferret, and the bee, are unique to the Greek formulation. Two of these animals are common in Europe, but not in the Indian subcontinent. Even though the Indian mongoose bears similar characteristics to the ferret, it is not mentioned in Bharata's list. The bee is auspicious in both cultures, but again does not figure in the list of animal similes in the Sanskrit version. The examination of the way in which the five common animals are described in both versions reveals certain overall general, but not so many specific similarities. This is probably due to the style in which each is formulated and the audience for each piece of literature. Both are in verse, so they qualify as poetry, and the message is the same. That is, most women who populate the world have basic characteristics that can best be described in terms of an animal. Consensus between the Greek and Sanskrit verses occurs in four specific ways the context of the man-woman relationship, the use of animal similes, the choice of the same five animals, and finally, the inclusion of both physical and psychological characteristics. The specific vocabulary and style of the descriptions vary because of cultural preferences and varying species of the common fauna. The latter is illustrated well by the sow, which is short-haired and small-bellied with large tusks in India and long-haired and fat in Greek. The Indian sow resembles a wild boar, while the Greek animal is a domestic pig. The cultural differences are seen in the, in the bitch, which is inauspicious in Greece, but both auspicious and inauspicious in India, and in the mare, whose physical characteristics were positive attributes in India, but ultimately inauspicious in Greece. The Natyat Shastra was a textbook of theater and theatrics, which among others provided examples of women, female characteristics to be imitated on stage. Simonides' poem was performed to the accompaniment of music at the symposium. Both have performance as their common denominator. While Simonides' poem was a theatrical form 
at the symposium, Bharata's verses were composed as tools for performance. As mentioned above, both poets employ, employ the same five animals in similes of female character types. The mention of these specific animals in the similes is where the two lists of apodices overlap. The remaining animals tend to be indigenous to each geographical, ecological, and cultural environments, while the use of the simile persists in both. The lack of the same vocabulary characteristics in both Sanskrit and the Greek effectively rules out direct literary borrowing. Therefore, we must contend ourselves with the fact that the commonality of the five female character types was at the level of the apodosis. A closer examination of the protasis of each version does, however, point to an overall structural similarity and division into both physical and psychological characteristics. Central to the protasis in both Greek and Sanskrit text is the inclusion of both the physical and the psychological traits and characteristics. Bharata, however, provides far more physical traits than does Simonides. The Sanskrit verses include primarily physical with some psychological characteristics and behavioral traits, including sexual preferences with no less than 10 distinctive marks for each woman. The Greek author has packaged the individual characteristics in the form of a satire, which reveals the woman's basic nature through predominantly psychological traits and sexual behavior. No more than eight characteristics are included in the corresponding animal types. Bartha's choice of these specific animal apodosis suggests that they were probably not random. Moreover, their occurrence in a list of animal similes used to describe the character of women implies familiarity with the use in Simonides' poem. A comparison of the Sanskrit and Greek versions of the five common animals reveals that on the average, there are two similarities for each female character type. Often they share at least one physical trait and sometimes they have a physical and psychological and or behavioral attribute in common. Due to the difference intended audience, the Greek version offers yeah, I, I probably there are isolated examples, yeah. but the grouping of the five or the ten or whatever seems to be rather unique. Yeah, it's interesting in the Indi in the Indian uh, uh, physiognomic tradition, going back to the ancient science tradition, they're males, and then Bharata take, takes the male and then applies it to the female. And it's already the female that we find in the Greek Semenides. So this kind of using uh, characteristic traits based on animals uh, seems to have been perhaps initially a male associated with the male of the species and then transferred over uh, to be used in the female as well. After the deal, I have one interesting example on physics from Wolfgang Lenz, but it's with a reversal because female women are compared to uh, drones, uh, which are praying uh, on and eating the word of bees, which are who are men. Uh -huh. uh, so those are not animals to wear comparison, which might be interesting, but uh, I, I think I made that reference between Wolfgang Lenz and the Sodari Roman Bacchus. Yeah, Where probably is. Like that, uh, comparing men with women. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. I, I just saw the passage uh, here on uh, 519. Yeah, it, it sent it to me in an email if you could. Yeah, just a uh, question out of, out of curiosity. Uh, do you know something comparable um, concerning male characters? 
the war is really something comparable with uh, Theophilus' uh, character in, in India. Something about what? Uh, I mean, it's a comparable list of characters, uh, well, the comparisons with animals uh, in male characters. Yeah. It lists something comparable with uh, Theophilus' uh, characters. No, I don't know that. I mean, certainly the male characters come come to us via uh, the uh, omen literature in India, which may be quite old, actually. But if there is this, uh, I'd appreciate the reference to it. Um, it, it what struck me is that, that not so much that, they, that, that similes do exist, as I say, but that the particular grouping of these five specific ones that if you look at the chart here that are not found, don't have a direct link. We have the Natya Shastra that I'm talking about. Then we have this Gargia text where you have a bunch of them in the beginning that you find connections to. But then you have a, a, a almost more than half that don't have any connections to Indian literature, but do seem to have a connection to Simonides, at least five. If it was one, I'd say, well, no, that doesn't mean much. But since five of them occur out of the total of 10, it seems to point to something a little bit more than coincidence. At least that's what I'm saying. And, and the key is not not like you do generally look at kind of Indo-European parallels that have no definite date or any kind of causal historical link. I tried to look at this as actually something that is ideas that are transmitted in real time uh, in and around the time that the Alexander was coming into India with his armies and so forth in that whole tradition of the symposium uh, then being transferred over and then this being part of that. I don't know. It's just some idea that an old man gets when he retires. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't discuss the, um, the animal fable as a genre which was I mentioned in India that, and, and, and Greek. Well, that, that certainly is there. And the, the, the idea that, the, that specific animals are associated with specific characteristics would be uh, that's a, that's something to look at yeah because certainly the animal fables are there uh, but they're not necessarily in these metaphoric constructions uh, where they uh, where they're specifically used to describe human types no, I was just wondering if you could perhaps could be could, could be what could be an idea to widen it out a little bit yeah that's right that's right yeah Good. Thanks. Thank you. So this was the, uh, the final session, but it's not really finished. But I would like you to take the opportunity and, and thank you, Laura, for, for having organized this. Uh, this was, I think it was extremely well organized. Um, but not only that, I think that it's always hard to predict what, what the content will be, even if the organization works fine. But I think it, I'm very impressed by, 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 by uh, generally, the general level, high level of the presentation. So, oh, thank you. So I'm very happy that, that you invited me. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, I think I can yeah. speak for all of you out yeah. yeah. there. Well. <laughs>
you didn't make me regret <laughs> <laughs> about inviting you, so I was very, very, very happy about that. Uh, also, uh, I didn't regret any, uh, like, we received uh, a lot of proposals for this uh, conference. We had to discard almost uh, the half of them, so um, it was... Uh, like thank you for putting me in such a difficult position <laughs> with your with your abstracts and with your with your choice of what to present. Um, and uh, I, I would like to thank all the speakers for their seriousness, for their um, commitment, <laughs> for their talks. Uh, um, thank you. Like if this conference would had a high level, it, it thanks to the speakers. So. And uh, uh, also very important, I would like to thank uh, the people who helped me, not only the department who, as I said, really provided uh, fantastic support to me, but also um, uh, Panille, who was uh, in charge of uh, the streaming here. Thank you. Thanks to her or her fault if we are all online and everybody can see and listen to us. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I also would like to thank um, Christiane and Anna uh, uh, who helped me with the, with the catering mm -hmm. organization. Like very, very important things. Food and drink. <laughs> They also had to face a lot of last minute problems. So really well done, amazing job. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, also other two uh, little things. One is about the possible publication of the proceedings. I would like to uh, publish the proceedings of this conference. So I will send you an email uh, as soon as I figure out a um, possible, like a, a concrete possibility for publication. And uh, I hope that uh, you will uh, all accept to submit, okay, uh, to send me at least an abstract. And, uh, but at the moment, I'm not able to provide you with some details. I'm sorry about that. And uh, last uh, but not least tonight, uh, I would like to remind um, the speakers uh, that uh, we are having conference dinner, not as previously announced, 7.30, but at 8.30. And uh, you're very happy about it because <laughs> we, <laughs> yes, we have, like, it's not very Danish as a, <laughs> as a, as a time, but... Uh, well, and with this, I close the conference and thank you again for your participation. Like, it's amazing to have so many people in an empty university on a Saturday evening. <laughs> thank you so much. And see you tonight. <laughs>